Welcome back. It's Intro to Physical Anthropology. I'm David Leitner, your instructor. Today, we are talking about bipedalism. That is, how did we come to start walking on just two limbs instead of four? Um, it's a really interesting story, and uh, it involves a lot of changes. So, um, I hope you enjoy. Let's get started. So, a big question for a long time was, you know, there are sort of three really defining traits of humans, it seems like, at least in terms of common sense. Uh, you know, most of us think about what makes humans unique. We think about, you know, we have big brains, intelligence, uh, we use tools, uh, and we walk upright, right? But of these three things, which comes first? Which of them came first for a long time, especially because they're kind of connected to one another. Um, you know, making tools takes bigger brains, uh, but it also requires free hands. So, you know, how are, you know, how are these related and which one came first? Well, the short answer is bipedalism. Uh, our big brains and stone tools don't really start until about two million years ago. The, that's when we start seeing the trend towards greater encephalization, that is, brain size compared to body size. But um, bipedalism predates that by almost five million years. So we have seven million year old fossils that indicate there may have been some experiments in bipedalism already going on. But what is bipedalism? Uh, bipedalism in humans is made possible because of lots of different anatomical changes over the course of evolutionary history. Um, so many that it probably didn't develop sort of all at once. Um, full bipedal emotion and full bipedal anatomy like we have today was set in place about 2 million years ago with Homo erectus. Closer to 1.8, but still. Um, so, much of the early course, you know, from that 7 million years to 2 million years ago, was the sort of development and refinement of bipedal anatomy. Um, and we're going to be looking at these traits, like to see where they come in, in when we look at later hominins, uh, some of the early hominins and, and, and the australopiths as well, uh, in order to sort of have some idea what we're looking for, for in terms of the ancestors of our own species. So some of the changes, let's work from the top down. Okay, so we'll call that the axial anatomy, right? So the anatomy through the major axis here of the body. Um, one of the most notable features in human bipedality is the position of something called the foramen magnum. Now, I keep telling you, Latin is actually a lot less scary than it sounds. Foramen magnum is the big hole on the bottom of your skull where your spine goes in, and foramen magnum in Latin literally just means big hole. Scientists are very literal, um, sometimes. Uh, the foramen magnum's position changes in a biped. It has we have to balance our skull directly on top above our center of gravity, unlike a quadruped who balances their skull out in front of the center of gravity. In addition, because a quadruped has to sort of have their head hanging out like this all the time, right? They have really big muscles in the, on the back of their heads that connect to the back of the skull to keep it from doing this thing. So you're not just looking down all the time. Um, modern human bipeds have much smaller muscle connections back there. So that occipital protuberance, that ridge that you can see on the back of both of these skulls, um, is much smaller. And the nuchal field, which is this uh, sort of plane, nuchal plane, which is this sort of 
plane of um, relatively flat bone on the skull, which the muscles attach to, uh, is much smaller and move more so that it points down more than back. So those are the two major skull adaptations. The vertebrae themselves have to change in a number of different ways. Um, for one thing, human vertebrae are much thicker and much less uh, uniform than quadruped vertebrae are. Uh, human vertebrae get even thicker as they go further down, and that's because each vertebrae is carrying the weight of the vertebrae and all of the flesh above it. So as you go down one, each one carries that much plus a little more, and that much plus a little more, and that much plus a little more. So by the time you get to the bottom, they're very, very thick. Uh, in addition, the shape of the spine changes considerably. This is to allow the, the bulk of the body mass to remain over the center of gravity here. Um, in quadrupeds, they have sort of a more C-shaped spine, sort of this, va this little crescent shape, okay, with just one curve to it. Humans have an S-shaped curve, or sort of a double S, really, uh, with a sort of curve in the lumbar region down here, and a curve in the, cerv uh, the cervical region up here as well. Um, that does a couple of things. Number one, it keeps the body centered uh, over the center of gravity. And number two, it also helps um, absorb some of the shock of walking bipedally. Uh, not a ton, but it, it does help sort of cushion the blow because Keep in mind, your brain inside of your skull has the consistency of sort of firm jello, right? It doesn't take a lot to injure it, and it doesn't take a lot of shock to injure it. And so absorbing shock as you walk is an important thing. As we move further down, we come to the hind limbs and the pelvis. The pelvis itself is much more bowl-shaped in a uh, biped than a quadruped. If you look on, on the top here, you can see that the uh, chimpanzee pelvis is very flat, right? Um, that is, the sort of gluteal muscles sort of attach in just kind of one direction on it. On the other hand, the biped um, pelvis, the, the ilium, that is, the, those blades that the gluteal muscles attach to, are curved so that you have actually multiple sort of regions, and that's because the gluteal muscles serve a separate purpose in bipeds. That is, they help us, even when we're just standing, make little corrections to keep us from tipping over. So we have muscles that control motion in lots of different directions, um, and that's a big part of what went on there. But it's also bowl-shaped because what happens to your organs when you go from being like this to like this? Well, gravity still pulls downwards. And that kind of helps keep things from spilling out. It doesn't do a great job. And remember, evolution works with what it has, not with the best solution. And so hernias are quite common in human bipeds as a result. <clears throat> the femur is a really interesting adaptation. Um, you'll notice in the chimpanzee on the left here, the femur is very straight. Uh, the angle between the femur and the plane of the, the tibia there, the, the um, proximal end of the tibia, is relatively vertical or perpendicular, right? So it's, it's almost straight up and down. And that leaves the knee quite far from the center of gravity here, okay? Uh, on the other hand, in the two bipeds, we see that the femur actually angles in slightly. Uh, and so you have the knees coming uh, closer to the medial line, where the this, this axis that the center of gravity is on is on. Of course, that's important because... When you're running, when you're walking bipedally, 
um, you need to keep from, in order to conserve energy, you don't want to have to be doing this all the time. And if you watch chimpanzees try to walk bipedally, which they do periodically, they walk like this with a, a definite sway because they have to shift their center of gravity to be over where their feet fall. Whereas for us, we shift where our feet fall to be under the center of gravity. Um, they're already pretty close to it. And that means we don't sway very much back and forth. It means we conserve energy. <clears throat> now, the uh, distal uh, end of the femur, that is the femoral condyles, um, because they are carrying much more weight than a quadruped's um, uh, femur would carry, have thickened in bipeds. Um, additionally, the tibia, the plane of the tibial condyle is much wider as well to accommodate that. That's very important, right? Otherwise, you know, you wouldn't be able to stand up. And of course, again, it's not a perfect solution because you'll notice we have lots of problems with our knees because they bear all of this weight. Um, again, Proof that evolution doesn't work w with the perfect solution, it works with what it has. Um, similarly, we have a deep patellar groove. Um, that is your kneecap, right? Your kneecap fits into this groove in the femoral condyle here, that green portion that you can see. Uh, and that is to help keep things locked in place and moving like this, right? Uh, knees are great at moving forward and backward. Put a little pressure in from the side, and anybody who's played soccer, or football, any, any kind of contact support will tell you just how easily a knee pops out. Uh, and when that happens, that's, that's not a good thing. Um, so that, um, but your patella sits in that groove to kind of keep everything in place. Feet. In, other primates, the feet are just like the hands. They have an opposable large digit, right? Uh, it's not, um, uh, it's not actually sort of tied together with the rest. Um, that's because we have this shared history of living arboreally, right? However, humans require a much firmer, more rigid platform to push off from, to gain some extra energy, some leverage. Uh, and so that comes at the cost of the opposability of the, of the hallux here. So instead, our feet are bound very tightly together by tendons and muscles. And as a result, it does a couple of things. Number one, uh, the we have shortened phalanges, that is our toes, and that allows us to push off like a springboard uh, with every step, regaining some of our motion. Uh, in addition, our heel is um, angled downwards, which gives the calf and the Achilles tendon more room to work their magic and actually provide... Um, leverage for that forward motion that propels us. You can see that in the gorilla foot here, that's much more difficult for it. Finally, to sum up, bipedalism required huge changes in primate anatomy, starting with, well, I don't want to say starting with, everything from the cranial anatomy to the spinal column to the pelvic uh, area and the muscles that attach to it and the legs and the feet. Everything all the way down was affected to produce this bipedal form. Um, and that's going to be really important when we're looking forward here because again, when we're looking for the most recent common ancestor between apes and humans, we want to look for something that's a little bit like both, right? Um, and understanding 
all of these changes is going to help us identify uh, those features in potential most recent common ancestors. Okay, that's it for now. Uh, please come back and we'll talk about why bipedalism. What may have been some of the driving forces behind it? What are some of the ways anthropologists have thought about it? And how is our thinking changing as we learn more about the environment during this time period of sort of four to eight million years ago? Uh, until then, take care, uh, be safe, and I'll see you soon.